Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion, setting forth his sovereignty, and the old pass of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious word of sovereign grace. Here's this week's message. Alone, that was to him. 
But for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Brethren, there's a lot in there that I still don't see as clearly as I'd like. And I just have to do as the Lord has blessed me to see. Uh, I especially am drawn to that 23rd verse where it says, Now was not written for his sake alone. If this lesson was just for Abraham, it'd be good enough, wouldn't it? But the marvelous thing about the lesson that we find taught in this, this experience of Abraham is something in which we all share. Something from which we can all benefit, not only uh, from the standpoint of, of doctrine, but I think also from the standpoint of obedience in everyday life. It was not written for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but for all us also. And notice the next phrase, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, looking at some of these words, I think it's important that we define them so that we are all on the same ground. You may not uh, agree with the ground that I'm on, but at least you'll know from where I'm coming. And specifically, I think it's important to understand the word impute or to define the word impute. Now, I may have a little bit different definition of that, but looking at the origin of that word, uh, I find a definition that, that, that means a lot to me in describing what I feel is taught therein. And the literal definition of the word to impute, of course, we have synonyms for it, reckon, account, charge. But uh, to impute literally means it's to make clear. To make clear. That's like wiping a window of dirt and being able to see through it. Or maybe of a mirror. And wiping that mirror clean and that it's crystal clear and you see clearly what's there. I think if we apply that definition, we get at least some of what the Apostle Paul is teaching us, or the Lord is teaching through the Apostle Paul for us today. Because remember, it wasn't written for Abraham's sake alone. It was written for us also. Uh, to whom it will also be made clear. You'll take my definition there. To whom it will also be made clear if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Now, there's a lot said about belief and what belief does and what it doesn't do. But I, I will say this about belief. If you believe something is so, it doesn't make that thing so. Because if something is true, if you believe it, it's, or don't believe it, it's still just as true whether or not you believe it. If it's false, uh, whether you believe it with all your heart that it's true, it's still false. But the marvelous thing about what we find contained within this, the truth as it is in Christ Jesus, when we believe it, I believe it's made clear to us. And many of the blessings that we find contained within the church and within the gospel and within discipleship is, uh, means more to us, certainly does, and this is, uh, certainly goes without saying, means so much more to us when we believe it. You know, how can you really be a member of the church unless you believe that Jesus is the Christ? How can you believe uh, that you need a Savior unless you first see that you are a sinner. You see, you've got to believe some things, you've got to see some things before other things are made clear to you. Now, looking at uh, the, the marvelous thing about we find here about, the, about Abraham is that he was 100 years of age. And that God had told him that, Abraham, you're going to have a son, you're going to have a son named Isaac by your wife, Sarah. And they had been married for many, many years. Uh, Abraham knew that according to nature, it was impossible by nature for him to have a child by Sarah. And yet, God said, it's going to happen. And Abraham, uh, remember the story, we were talking about this at lunch. God took Abraham out one starry evening, and he said, uh, if, if you can tell the stars, uh, you'll be able to tell your seed for number. You see, there is something that God is showing to Abraham, and through Abraham to us, is that in believing what God has promised to us, we make these things, if you'll take my meaning, we make these things clear to ourselves. And we begin to enjoy, uh, even before they actually happen, the things. There's an essence of the word hope that we take, that I, that I take great enjoyment in. 
you know, there's a, a threefold uh, meaning to the word hope. One, the root of that is expectation. Now, hope is expectation. We hope for something, we expect it to happen. But you know, there's another word that, that also comes into this definition of hope, and it's the word anticipation. And to anticipate something means to enjoy something before you actually get it. And that's the marvelous thing about seeing the great nature of God, the great power of God, and even more specifically to see Jesus Christ and Him crucified, is that in believing that He did what He said that He did, we are able to enjoy uh, the nature of that salvation even before the finality of it comes to pass. Amen. That's the marvelous thing about belief. And one of the uh, 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 verses uh, in Ephesians uh, that means a lot to me, I know it does to you, Brother Ralph, is that, th that this belief, or this ability to believe, is not something that you just take on to yourself, but it's according to the working of His mighty power. You see, it's God's power that reveals to you uh, His marvelous goodness, His marvelous grace, and in believing it, it's made clear to you. It doesn't mean that it comes to pass there or it, uh, it just started at that time, but in a, in a very personal, in a very real sense, it becomes something yours when you believe it and you act on it and you move out on it. And when and in so doing, uh, you become just like Abraham was, in confidence of the fact that you're going to have a child. Uh, you're going to have that child of promise even before that child was born. Believing in it. Notice, here we find some things about, about Abraham. He says in the 18th verse, Who against hope? Believed in hope. Have you ever been in that situation when uh, uh, you realize uh, something that had been promised to you? You see uh, the bill collectors maybe, or you see uh, the issues of the nation or of your community, and you wonder uh, that it's uh, almost impossible for that particular thing to pass, and yet you believe it, and, uh, and lo and behold, it comes to pass. You see, uh, I, can, I can say this uh, without a shadow of a doubt. It wasn't necessarily your belief that brought it to pass, but it was through your belief that you were able to enjoy the fact that it was going to come to pass. And I think this is the marvelous essence of what we have. And if you notice here, Abraham says he didn't have any reason to expect that he was going to have a child. Uh, he had no reason to expect it at all. As a matter of fact, he wanted that child by Hagar to be that promised child. And he says, uh, but nevertheless, something within him persuaded him. Yeah. Something within him worked mightily within him. And he, even though he had no natural reason to believe it was going to come to pass, he still believed it, you see. Uh, now, how does that apply to us? Well, my friends, uh, I can see uh, a couple of applications at least uh, uh, for us. You look at that last verse in the fourth chapter of Romans, and you see how it, that it applies to us. It says about Jesus Christ who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. What good is it going to kill you, my friends, uh, as far as your enjoyment and your satisfaction, your anticipation in this life, if you, if you don't believe the, the truth that's found within that verse of Scripture? You've got to see it and you've got to believe it. The numbers here, the first thing that we find in that last verse, it says, who was delivered for our offenses. You know what? It's something that you have to believe before some marvelous things can take place in your life. You've got to believe you're a sinner. You've got to accept the fact that you're a sinner. Isn't that a, a, a psychologist around the world, if they, heard me say, if they hear me say this, uh, are probably uh, uh, dropping to the ground in amazement that somebody in this modern day and age would, uh, would, in, uh, would encourage people to see that they're vile sinners, uh, that they are base sinners, uh, that they were born sinners, uh, and that they'll die sinners. But my friends, you've got to believe you're a sinner, and you won't. Some things won't be made clear to you until you believe you're a sinner. You see, uh, we all know that as a fact. Uh, you won't begin to see the second half of that verse uh, uh, be uh, the real essence in your life until, first of all, you see that Jesus Christ went to the cross for your offenses. Uh, you've got to see that it was your offenses that sent Jesus Christ to the cross. You've got to see that it's your offenses that caused him to be nailed painfully to that, uh, uh, that cross on Calvary's tree. And you've got to see that your offenses uh, uh, is the reason why that he laid down his life for you. Uh, so that uh, uh, in, in the final analysis, that he was raised again for our justification. It'd be terrible if you just left it in believing that you're a sinner. So my friends, uh, uh, if you believe that you're a sinner, you've also got to believe that you need a Savior. Uh, uh, you've got to believe that you need a Savior. And that's the marvelous thing in seeing Jesus Christ and you crucified. You see that Savior, my friends. Uh, and here's part of that thing that Abraham had was that anticipation and that enjoyment of having a son, the promised son, even before the promised son.
son was born. Uh, I don't know how much longer it was after that time of the 15th chapter of Genesis. It might have been a year or a couple of years later. I forget which. But for a couple of years, Abraham uh, uh, enjoyed the, uh, the idea, although sometimes he didn't enjoy it as well as at other times. But he enjoyed the idea. He enjoyed the fact of the promise that God had promised that he's going to have a son. And uh, uh, he enjoyed it so much, as a matter of fact, that at the time, when, they, when God came to him and said to take Isaac, uh, thy only son, uh, up into the mountain and sacrifice him. You know what? He believed uh, so strongly in, in the promise that God had made to him that God would be able to raise that very self-same son from death uh, and cause him to live again. You know, that's the marvelous thing about, uh, about real faith, about real belief. It, makes, it enables you to see things uh, that are just beyond rationality, uh, beyond uh, logistics, uh, beyond reasoning, uh, to see beyond the veil, as it were. Uh, you know, that's part of our hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Uh, you know, it, it takes faith, my friends, in every aspect of your life. You just got to believe it sometimes. Uh, I, I know that's an uh, uh, overly warm phrase, but I hear that sometimes to the point of makes me sick. You just got to believe it. You see, you just got to believe it. But you know, there is a proverb that Solomon wrote, that as a man thinketh, thinketh in his heart, so is he. Uh, you know, uh, many times uh, I, uh, at where I work, they have these motivational courses or classes, and they say, you know, have these motivational statements that you read and think about the first thing you, uh, uh, before you go to bed, the first thing when you wake up in the morning. And if you think about them long enough, sooner or later, you'll begin to act that way. You know, there's an element of truth to that. Uh, the thing that's not true is it causes you to trust too much in yourself, possibly. My friends, we can't do that. We've got to put our trust wholly and 100% in the God of heaven, the uh, God of glory. But there is an element of truth to that, and I, I re uh, refer you back to that proverb, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, if you want to be a, uh, a, a, an obedient child of God, uh, if you want to obey, well, you find there in the 11th chapter of Hebrews where it talks about true faith, uh, Abraham obeyed. Uh, you see, there are so many things, there's about 30 things that the 11th chapter of uh, Hebrews relates that true faith or by faith that you can do. Uh, it's impossible to really tell you what faith is. You've just got to do it. Uh, you know, that's what James said. Uh, faith without works is dead, being alone. Uh, we have to not only think it, but we've got to act on it. And that's what Abraham did. And he is denoted now as the father of the faithful. He is the one uh, that, uh, that says, and being fully persuaded that what he promised, he was able also to perform. I think of that great promise that God made to Abraham. And you know, that great promise that God made to Abraham uh, was a shadow of that great promise that he made to his son, Jesus Christ, before the world began. That as he chose all his people in Christ before the world began, the promise is as Paul told Titus, in hope of eternal life, which God made cannot lie promised before the world began. And you know what he also says uh, in Hebrews? He says uh, uh, that God, uh, because he can swear by no greater than himself, uh, uh, made that promise to Abraham. Uh, and that promise, my friends, uh, speaks of that great promise which is made to all his people through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, my friends, uh, as we begin to look at this some more, I want to look at some more definitions of those words. Uh, uh, there's uh, one word that we want to get to, and it says uh, uh, stagger. It says uh, in the uh, 20th verse, it says, He staggered not at the promise of God. I've often thought of what that word means, and there's some, there's some really interesting uh, uh, flavors we get out of that word stagger. You know, one of the, the, the real definition of it is uh, to stagger means to reel or to vacillate. Uh, and many times I think we're about, we're like that. We vacillate. We go uh, back and forth many times, not making a firm stand as we should. But you know, I found another definition. I'll just share this with you. Uh, uh, another meaning of the word stagger, a literal uh, meaning of that word stagger means to punt. And if you think of it like that, Abraham didn't punt when God made that uh, promise to him. You know, we use that statement today. Uh, there was, uh, in the old olden times, uh, even before Brother Dickey and Brother Ralph, there was such a whole time ago, back in high school and all that. And it was a sport that they used when they uh, didn't have any hope of finishing their section of the game. They punted. And, you know, uh, here's something that we might say, well, Abraham had, if anyone had a reason to punt and to call it quits and get over with it, it would have been Abraham. But it said he staggered not. Uh, uh, at the promise of God grumbling, but we're strong in faith. You think glory to God. If you really want to know how to, uh, uh, to live a proper life in the faith, it, let that last phrase of that 21st stay strong in your mind, giving glory to God. That is the essence of our life. That it should be the motivation of our life. Uh, the guiding rule of our life 
is giving glory to God. And in so doing, we follow the truth of the true way, the right way. Uh, there's another word I want to look at. And uh, it's two of the words, uh, uh, mainly, uh, is to persuade and to perform. You know, uh, it says he was persuaded, strongly per persuaded, that what God had promised to him, that God would be also be able to perform that which he promised. And you know, those two words have a very similar meaning. The word persuade means this, to thoroughly advise. You know, uh, God took him out that night, and he told him to tell the stars. There's another word I want to bring into this. It's the word consider. It says, Abraham considered not his own body. Now, dead. you know the word consider, uh, it's just marvelous how the plan of Scripture works together. It fits together like hand and You know that word consider uh, means, it means literally, it used to mean when it first came into the being many, many years ago, to contemplate the stars. No, no, it's not for the To contemplate the stars. And that's what God did to Abraham. He took him out and he said, look at the stars. You tell the stars. Not speak to the stars, but you name them. You look at the pattern that's found within those constellations. And what you'll see is the marvelous eternal purpose of God in the salvation of his people. And because of that, because of looking at that eternal purpose of God and seeing how that God is a self-existent God, He is an eternal being, has no beginning, no end, seeing how that God has everything firmly in His control and is guiding things according to His will, He considered not His own body, now dead. He staggered not, He reeled not. But you know, here's another thing to look at. It says He was persuaded. As I said, it was advised thoroughly. And we might say that God gave Abraham some good advice that night, didn't he? He says, you're going to have a child, a son, and his name should be called Isaac. And in Isaac shall I seek you called. But there is another thing that we find within the word persuade. I hope this isn't important to anybody, and I hope this is of help. But a, a, another deeper meaning to the word persuade means to make sweet. Now that's a marvelous thing. To make sweet. And I think, a, a contrary to God, when Satan tries to persuade us to do things, it's never a sweet tasting thing. It leaves a bad taste in your mouth. But when God persuades you, and He persuades you through His Holy Spirit, I believe He persuades you through this book that He does, it is a sweet thing. It is a marvelous thing. It is a full thing. And it is something that will, that is a thing of sustenance. Something that will lead you along the sweet, the right way. He persuades <laughs> He moves within us. Is Christ in you the hope of glory, as it were? God living in you, persuading in you, working in you both to will and to do of His good pleasure. And He's persuading you that what He has promised, He is able also to perform. And that is to provide or to thoroughly provide. God promises, He performs. Uh, that's about the only thing that you can say that of. You can't say that about the church or about men, or any institution upon this earth, but God Himself is the only one who is thoroughly able to provide for that which He has promised. You know, we try and we think we worry in our, our wicked feet of minds uh, that uh, how is it possible that God can remember where every one of His people has been laid in the, in the earth? You know, some have been burned and their ashes have been scattered to the, to the four corners of the earth. Uh, some uh, bodies have been uh, torn and strewn uh, uh, and, and not, not be able to put together. And, and all the nameless sin, the forgotten people that have lived upon the earth. But you know what? If they're a child of God, God knows exactly where that body is. He's able to provide that for that which He's promised, my friends. And He says... Uh, uh, he said, uh, uh, reading once again there in, in the fourth chapter of, uh, of, of Romans, he says he staggered not at that promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, that doesn't mean Abraham was a perfectly sinless individual. No, I think the most marvelous thing about it is Abraham was just a man like you and I. Uh, he had his concerns, his problems. He had his doubts, his fears, and his anxieties. And many times, he probably would say, just as that man did, who asked Jesus Christ to go to his house and heal his sick child, says, uh, uh, Jesus asked him, do you believe? And that man said, Lord, I believe. That's well, I believe. You know, the marvelous thing, though, is that God knows. Uh, belief is something, I don't know if I can really describe it or, or define it. I think I can see two, two types of belief that are taught in the Scriptures. 
And, and I think you can find those embraced in the first, chap first chapter of Romans. And belief, uh, and sometimes uh, the, t the two can be confused with one another. At least I've confused the two with one another. And, and that is this. You know, in the first chapter of Romans, it talks about uh, the wrath of God is revealed. And it talks about the things of nature and that every, all human beings, all of all humanity is able to see through nature that there is a God. And from that standpoint, believe that God exists. Uh, we think back, and, and Job, we were talking about this at lunch, Job, God a lot of the times talked about the stars, didn't he? And there's a lot to be said about looking at astronomy and looking at the, the laws that govern this, this great earth in which we live, that there is a, there's an orderly presence behind all these things. There is a supreme being. And what we do find uh, through study of nature, study of astronomy, is this. As Paul himself said, is eternal power in Godhead. Also, what we find about this great God is that, uh, as it says, we find order in the universe that he requires of all his creation an orderly life. He requires of them to live orderly. There are laws that govern not only the way uh, gravity works or the way the wind blows, but our relationship to one another. And whether you're a child of God or not, you're obligated to your creator to do those things. To recognize that he exists and to give him the glory and honor that is due him. But I find that's one belief. The other belief is something a little bit more, there's a lot more to it than the first belief. And that second belief is this. It is, it can be summed up in this, a love for God. It is a, a, a belief that's based on love for God. And how does that differentiate between the other beliefs? Well, one says merely that God exists. The second says, I believe he exists and I love him. And I want to serve him. That's what, that's what differentiated Abraham and that's what differentiates us if indeed we are children of God. Is that desire to do that which is pleasing to him. And in so doing, we manifest our belief. Now, as we continue to look at that belief, it says, Abraham, it says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. That's what makes the difference between a child of God and one who is. It's the giving of glory to God. And, and it says, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. I realize so much uh, over the years has been written about this, but uh, in closing, let me just say, it says, to point out a, a, a fact in that 24th verse, it says, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus from the dead. The thing that I see, and this transcends denominational boundaries, this transcends uh, uh, whether or not you're a, a, a Christian or, or wherever you're raised, there is something in the child of God, if he's a born-again child of God, that causes him to believe in that great God and Father of our souls. And, and as it says, believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. And, and that is a natural or a supernatural impulse to the working of the Spirit in all of God's elect. They're going to believe in God. Their, their knees are going to bow to God and humble adoration to Him. They may not call uh, the name Jesus Christ, but they're going to know that their Father lives and cares for them in heaven for their souls. But my friends, it's a, to bring out the further aspect of this, in seeing Jesus Christ, what we see is that perfect representation of the Father and, and which enables us to truly see the marvelous glory that God has for His, his uh, saints in the church of the living God. He says, for us also, to whom it shall be made clear. If you'll take my definition for that. To whom it shall also be made clear if we believe on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Uh, the, the subject of justification, I realize, is something that is really not the essence of what we're talking about here. But justification, as I see it, literally means 
to declare, to show. In some cases it means to make righteous, but in the large part it means to declare righteous. And in seeing Jesus Christ and Him crucified, what we see is first of all our sins, we see our need for a Savior, and then what we see is that He was raised again for our justification. I hope that uh, what I've said has been a benefit of glory to God that has been to give God's praise and glory. Word of Sovereign Grace a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.